Dean Fluka, welcome inside the Brooklyn boardroom, man. It's a pleasure to have you here. Pleasure to see you again, even though it's uh, audio, I mean, it's digital, but it's it's great to uh, be back in the conversation again. So welcome to the Brooklyn boardroom. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, is, <laughs> is the technology great, right? Yeah, what would we do but for Zoom, Skype? I remember back in the day, as a quick aside, I, you know, you, I was communicating with friends overseas and the technology like five, like six, seven years ago, the technology wasn't what it is today. So it's just a huge difference in the ease of communication. It's crazy. No, really, it truly is though. Oh, oh the, my the, goodness. The, the amount of Zooms that I have in a day are <laughs> insane. It's, it's probably twice as, no, probably three times as many meetings you'd have in real life, right? Because they can pack those Zooms in, whereas you can't get from Studio City to Beverly Hills and you know, Oh so, yeah. It, yeah, it used to be you'd have maybe like four at, at tops, maybe five in a day. Now you can have up to like six or seven in a day. And it's just That's painful, bro, painful. I feel your pain, I feel your pain. So I'm gonna introduce you, Dean. So listen, um, for those tuning in, audio, visually, both, who knows? I just wanted to let you know, Dean Fluker is an agent at UTA, um, a very, very successful agent at UTA, but more important than that, he contributed to the progress you've seen in this country by engaging in the political landscape of our nation. Dean actually, you know, early in his career, early after his education, started out working for then Senator Barack Obama on his 2008 presidential campaign. And he also served as a political appointee working for President Obama's healthcare bill on the First Lady's uh, Michelle Obama's Let's Move initiative before returning to the entertainment industry. So um, so we appreciate the public service you've done, Dean, as well as the work you're doing in the business, deal making and, and, and moving, you know what I mean? You know, it's all, all we can do, right? Yeah, all we can do. No, but it's cool, man. Not a lot of us get a chance, you know, to, to touch, you know, things that are gonna change the lives of Americans and be close to the people that really have their thumb on the the pulse of the nation. I mean, you come on, you worked for the, you know, our president, you know what I mean? Then he was a senator, but you you contributed to that um, great achievement of him being the first African-American president we've ever had. So I see, I mean, I know how much you value that experience and how important it is to you, but um, so you already know, but I just, I just want to acknowledge it because it's really cool, it's really, really deep, so. Well, thank you, appreciate yeah. that. My pleasure, my pleasure. So we're going to jump right in and let you tell us what you actually do for those who may be watching this that are on a little bit on the junior side of their uh, journey, their professional journey, whether they're students or ju junior executives, help them understand kind of your role as an agent and how the agent role works alongside managers, law lawyers when like brokering deals and packaging talent. Yeah. Well, look, I, I, I appreciate you bringing up the, the Obama experience because that's honestly what kind of shaped me coming here in the first place. Mm -hmm. In that, you know, it, it, an opportunity to be able to advocate for artists um, is a similar skill set to what you would find working for a candidate like somebody like Obama in the run up to an election. And then, of course, when you're in the actual administration, it's a lot of advocating for different legislation, different ideas, different goals. And, and it really translated here. And had I not kind of seen how the federal government ran and how our political system ran and, and how I thought it was so critical to have people that, you know, have different diverse backgrounds and experiences. Uh, if I felt like I couldn't kind of come up and try to advocate on behalf of some of those artists that, you know, when I was growing up, I'm sure similarly, like just weren't a lot of people like, you know, that looked like me on television and that always inspired me to say, okay, well, how can I help change things? Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and so for, for me, it really kind of came down to a feeling that the entertainment industry was at, is the, the, I always like to say the last great American commodity, so to speak, mm -hmm. that is, is exported, you know, worldwide, right. Um, mm -hmm. on a very global scale. And so, um, for me, it kind of became saying, okay, I want to advocate for these artists and work with, with people and, and, and try to move them forward in this industry of, of entertainment, which is, you know, the lifeblood is storytelling, right? And mm -hmm. how do we continue to tell stories and who do we infuse or put into these different stories, whether it's on the television or the film side. So mm -hmm. to kind of bring it back a little bit more then, it's, 
you know, for me, I work, I came up in, in the talent, you know, department and space, uh, working with actors and, and actresses and such in particular, because I had loved media when I was growing up and, mm -hmm. and I was one of those kids who worked at Blockbuster when that was a thing, you know, so yeah, I remember Blockbuster. Me, always, <laughs> always into uh, film in particular. But the, the industry was changing, you know, this is late 2011 and such, and, and it was slowly starting to rotate more into the television space. That mm -hmm. was where you were seeing the most interesting stories, right? And mm -hmm. where uh, the buyers, right? Buyers being the studios and the networks were taking the most risks in the television space. And so that mm -hmm. was really interesting to me to kind of be a, a part of that. And um, it was, you know, I think, Prior to this year, I think in 2019 alone, it was 500 odd new original scripted shows that were wow. on the air, you know? Wow. Um, and so it was just such a powerful medium and you could see that, uh, cause again, this was, Netflix was still in the red envelopes and, and but it, the streaming, the advent of streaming uh, was really becoming popular and such. And, and Netflix had just put into development what became House of Cards. And so, you know, it was a really, a really great time. And I think for me, that's what made me move towards more on the television side than maybe the mm. traditional business of film, which I love and was always a cinephile and, and still really enjoy. But I think on a day to day, you know, if you're going to build a business and you're going to be in the talent space, I still think it makes the most sense to spend a lot of your time in, in television, right? Mm. Um, and so, you know, I, I spend in, in my day to day really looking at that space, whether it's something that we would call actively casting projects that are essentially they have an open role and we think it could be really critical and, and great for one of our actors or actresses to jump in and be a part of it. Uh, but I also spend a lot of time looking at material, whether it's an article you know, from a magazine or New York Times or something to that effect, whether it's a podcast now, um, any kind of, a, a, you know, piece of material that could, you could create a great story around, right? Mm. And maybe there's a role for, I don't know, a young actress or something in it. And, you know, trying to see if there's an opportunity to package that up. And, and in a lot of cases, a lot of our, our artists are thinking more professorial anyway, and mm -hmm. that they want to be creating um, projects and they want to learn both aspects of the business where, you know, it, and it's a great education for them to be able to go and chase down articles. So mm -hmm. I, I spent a lot of time doing that. Um, wow. And then I also spent a lot of time, what we do, we call in-house packaging, so to speak of, mm -hmm. you know, reading material, then thinking who could be a showrunner or a filmmaker that would be great for it, who would be maybe um, the appropriate writer if it's still in an infant stage or something like that, that could use a little bit more direction um, or is just a piece of material. And then of course, who is, you know, somebody from the talent side, who is an actor that has a, a level of value, you know, uh, that could really help make this project go so that we can go out to the different buyers, studios and networks and, and try to sell something like this to them. Mm. So it sounds to me like you wear a hat, you, you, you're a hybrid of creative and business pretty much at all times. And you're expected to think in an innovative kind of way and see potential for opportunities that may not be obvious on the on the surface. So I think it obviously requires a certain level of um, vision as well as advocacy, right? So tell me this, you also mentioned how, you know, the, the kind of the expectation or the responsibility to work within your organization, partner with other colleagues, but you know, the agency world to a lot of people outside that world is a little bit mysterious. So can you break down kind of the hierarchical or the structural uh, uh, framework of, an, of a talent agency vis-a-vis -vis the agents and other parties that may be there running the businesses? How that? Well, most, most of these agencies, you know, their core function and, and business has always been the traditional, you know, talent and literary departments mm -hmm. on both film and television and, and, you know, talent obviously being anybody basically who's in front of the camera and, and generally then the literary side being the writers, directors, producers, and even extending to below the line. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, you know, 
most of the agencies came up under you know that kind of a, a paradigm or a model for example and then have added and expanded different departments as they've seen fit mm -hmm. uh and so you know it, a lot of them have come up most of us have music you know arms at this point mm -hmm. um some of us then have you know, done a lot more in the philanthropic areas and, mm -hmm. and have a foundation that can help a lot of these artists uh, reach out and be engaged in different causes or their own causes and help start, you know, different projects and, and be a part of passion issues for them. Mm -hmm. uh, we've also then gotten into the business of you know, a lot of like even like the marketing and in beyond just like say an endorsement deal, um, actually taking an idea of say you know if you want to have a line of vodka or i don't know some sort of whiskey or something working with certain talent to be able to take that out into the marketplace and mm. what is you know designing the bottle what does it look like who are you aiming it at and so uh, we've gotten to a place where generally if there's anything that an artist could at all think about being a part of we want to support and and so if you can we always say so to speak if you can dream it we can help you build it or create mm. it or do it um and then sometimes it, it goes beyond that you know oftentimes we are always trying to think about things that our artists aren't even there yet right and mm -hmm. and to kind of go back to your point it it is it's very a very visionary role and you have to be a level of you have to be an entrepreneur there's just no way mm -hmm. to do it but you have to have a short-term point of view and, and a long-term point of view and sometimes mm -hmm. um you know it's about kind of connecting the dots on a lot of different things and creating these relationships for for artists but knowing what you want to try to accomplish in the six months to the first next year versus what you're trying to then position certain people to be able to do in the next five years, right? Or mm. 10 years, you kind of have to mm. have in the back of your mind that those goals and, and also listening to the artists, like what do they want to do, right? Mm -hmm. Some artists would just be ha very, very happy being on a, on a sitcom on, you know, the Fox network. And that's a fantastic. That's great. Mm -hmm. Right. And you can make that happen. And that's as, as much as they really want to engage. Other folks really want to touch all aspects of, of an agency and in all aspects of entertainment, you know, and you mm -hmm. have those artists that, um, you know, kind of weave in and out and you have a large team of people then behind them. Right. Mm -hmm. In a lot of cases, some of the, you know, bigger artists, uh, you will typically have much larger teams and a cross section of the agency there to support them. And it's not just so much in a, a literary sense or a talent sense, but also, you know, an endorsement department sense, maybe they have a marketing agent, somebody who's helping them with, you know, their branding, um, you know, and essentially uh, on the producerial side, you know, again, if it's uh, about doing doing more and say the unscripted alternative television space, then we would have an agent there. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it really are a lot of different layers to it and the business and the agencies have, have all relatively grown over the last several years, um, you know, to be able to have the ability to help a, a client do and accomplish any idea or goal that they could possibly have. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, we, we still have, agents and executives you know most agencies have some uh, you know a a president or ceo or a board or or some a partnership right in some cases mm -hmm. people who are running things day to day and and then beyond that you know we we have uh the support of a number of you know whether it's trainees or agents uh up and coming agents agents in training um mm -hmm. you know junior agents it, it every agent kind of names it a little bit differently, but most of the the larger ones have pretty thorough programs of bringing people into the agency and training them to eventually be promoted and groomed to be the next generation. Mm. Well, you know, you talk, you mentioned how important the experiences you had um, in terms of the policy work you did for the Obama, um, for the Obamas, as well as some of the other things, you know, offline, we talked about, you know, the talent booking you did early in your career while you were in school. I mean, are there any other experiences that you think you might have benefited from 
um, that would have prepared you, you know, uh, for the role you have now, whether they were classes or jobs or perspectives, or do you feel like you, you know, the, the journey you had thus far in terms of before you got the agency world really was sufficient enough to prepare you for all these various things you do? You know, I honestly think it is, it's one of those situations where you don't know at the time how valuable some of those experiences are, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and for me, I kind of, when you are put at the, you know, somewhat of the forefront um, and, and very early on on a, on a campaign like, you know, Senator Barack Obama's at the time, I will never forget and again, I'm, I would have been probably, I would have been 22. And I, I remember having rigorous um, meetings with our communication staff and, mm -hmm. and, and our, our messaging departments. And they, and they largely would set the tone and say, anything that you've done up until this point, you know, and this was still early on in the Facebook era, mm -hmm. Twitter wasn't around yet, but I, I remember saying, you need to be on message. So you can't just go off and talk about different, talk to any newspaper that's in your own little local hometown. You know, you should all clean up your Facebooks if you're, you don't feel that it's, you know, by, by the book, but you, you don't do anything you wouldn't want to see on the cover of Time Magazine. And I'll just oh. never, it, I, I will never forget um, Josh Ernest, who now is a, a, a commentator, political commentator, saying that, and it always stuck with me in that, mm -hmm. okay, you, you, people, when you, you get into college, you, I think a lot of people have a tendency to be a little bit more reckless sometimes with mm -hmm. everything that they're doing. Uh, and I always thought, oh yeah, you know, it's, it's a good moment to kind of reel it back in and, and think more macro about how you're interacting with, with people. And, mm -hmm. and I say that just to, to think I was always an extension of Barack Obama, so to speak on, on the campaign or in the administration. And I never wanted to do anything that would at all like incriminate him for whatever reason. I had such respect and loyalty to him and his family. Um, so, so for me, it was kind of a, a you know, we kind of had this mantra of respect, empower, include, and 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 I, I I still think you know having come from a military family, I would have always been you know pretty by the book and 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 thoughtful with how I use language and learning how to kind of, as we say in the business, read a room. But mm -hmm. you know it is it is something that I think a lot of people, if you're not used to a version of public speaking, whether it's in a group of 10 or a group of 500 on a somewhat regular basis, and it's not necessarily a big discussion moment. I think a lot of people have a hard time with that. And, and that was one of the things that I was always really happy with in that, mm. you know, I, it was instilled in me at a, a pretty still like, you know, early age in my um, adulthood, right, coming into my, you know, early 20s of being respectful, being inclusive and, and empowering, being kind of like a big mantra. And so um, I, I've always kind of tried to carry that forward and, and, you know, would describe as kind of one of the greatest like secret strengths that, you know, if you, if you can, if you can do a campaign and be out there and, you know, really for me, I was one of the youth vote directors as a, 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 when I was on the campaign. And so it was a lot of speaking to large groups of, of young people who was, you know, generally around my age and urging them all to like go out and vote. Mm. Um, and to me though, I, I just think that was uh, such a, a learning, just a, the large best learning experience I could have ever had that really helped with this job that every, you know, lots of interesting personalities in, in the entertainment business, but yeah, you have a lot of the same idea, or, you know, interesting personalities in, in politics too. And yeah. it was, you know, being able to kind of rally them or, or realize, you know, how, what somebody's strength might be and what they might be comfortable with, but what somebody else might not be and how to kind of get a point or a message across in a way that they will receive it. Um, it was always something that I think, you know, I, I took for granted because I, I kind of learned that 
you know, in particular through working with the, the Obama campaign. Wow. A lot of gems in there, especially for the younger generation, being on message, not sharing something on social media and an email that you don't want to see on the cover of it. I'm not sure if it's a Time Magazine, but whatever. But like a lot of gems in there. That's that's really valuable. It's, it sounds very commonsensical, but we know that common sense is very common, especially when you're young. So I, I hope people listening to this, and this also play, play, is important, obviously, for a lot of uh, professionals, you know, who are seasoned professionals that don't always think through, you know, kind of that whole being on message and you are a brand and, and reading the room and paying attention, you know what I mean? So a lot of great gems. So let me ask you this. So, you know, we have a sense that, most people have a sense that, you know, being an agent is a really challenging job at times. You know, you're kind of always on, a little margin for, for personal time. But walk us through kind of, I mean, I'm sure no day is the same, but but maybe there are some patterns or some themes that happen throughout your day. Just walk us through kind of like when you saw it literally and then kind of the things you do on a daily basis related to the job. Generally on a day-to-day -day basis is a lot of reading. Um, you know, it, for me, I, I historically quarantine COVID uh, era aside, mm -hmm. historically read a lot in the mornings um, mm -hmm. because it was just a really good time. Like there aren't too many emails coming in and you're not too distracted at the beginning of the day. Sometimes mm -hmm. the evenings, you still have a lot of correspondence coming in that yes, yeah, people are kind of catching up with their days in, you know, Los Angeles time in particular, that you'll still get a lot of emails that you should probably be thinking or looking at, you know, up until maybe nine o'clock at night sometimes. Mm. sometimes. But, okay. um, you know, one of the things that I, I, I started doing, particularly over the course of the last couple of years, is really trying to set more boundaries. You know, when mm. I'd come up in with a mindset and a frame that you are, uh, this is a business where it's 24 seven and, and, and to degree it is, I think you should always be kind of mindful of that. But, uh, I think for, for everybody's, you know, just your mental, uh, capacity, you have to kind of set some boundaries a little bit more, um, and turn off your notifications on your phone, uh, which I think it, are, it was very helpful, but, uh, mm. a, a day to day is a lot of phone calls, generally a lot of um, now zooms, but you mm -hmm. know, historically meetings in person. Um, and, and of course, a lot of uh, a lot of emails and mm. often dealing with, you know, at, when our, our organization in particular, most of the core, you know, core, the agencies that have kind of the core business or focus on the lit and the talent, as I said at the, the top of the conversation, mm -hmm. generally have people who have a responsibility to different networks or studios or production companies. Mm -hmm. And that responsibility for me is then, you know, reaching out to the different producers that are within my coverage, if you will, mm -hmm. um, and making sure that I know what their needs are that week, whether it's on the talent side. Sometimes I'll even try to find out what's going on on the lit side, just so I can anticipate certain projects. Mm -hmm. um, and really just kind of being uh, very much in their lives on a day-to-day -day basis. And a lot of those executives mm -hmm. have become really good friends of mine uh, that I, I talk to regularly beyond just work and um, and really kind of bond with because you, you know, if you're really doing the job appropriately, you are, it's almost as if you're working at those companies that you cover. Mm -hmm. um, and so it is a lot of conversations with producers and casting directors and, and executives. And then, you know, I would say probably a fourth of the day or so is also talking to your different artists, right? Um, you know, and, and I think it kind of rotates sometimes. Some artists you, you talk to pretty frequently, others you only talk to when there are actual there's actual movement, right? There's yeah. actual something, there's tangible things to be doing or goals or projects to be aware of and, uh, and, and action items. Mm -hmm. um, and other clients, it's, it's just about, you know, they're, they are 
maybe they're one of the musician clients and they have a tour schedule. And so you're only talking to them when they kind of come up from air, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it's just kind of, uh, it ebbs and flows a little bit, but no, no days are really ever the same. Uh, the mm -hmm. only thing that makes them similar is that you, you do have standing meetings uh, for the agency generally where it's an, it's an opportunity to check in and see what's going on in everybody else's responsibility, everybody else's coverage. And also mm -hmm. just know, you know, we like to share information of what we watched recently that we really mm -hmm. enjoy, who has new mm -hmm. projects coming out. Um, mm -hmm. You know, sometimes an email is sufficient, but other times you, you, you need to be able to, as we like to say, kind of sell it in the room, right? Really mm -hmm. hear it. You know, I, I think a, a core principle to any successful agent is passion. They are mm -hmm. going to be passionate about what they do and who they represent and who they care about because you know, for me, it, this has always kind of generally been a dream being a part of the entertainment industry. Uh, mm. you know, I always was was so curious about it at a young age and wanted to be a part of it. And so I always feel very fortunate and lucky to have had opportunity to get here and be a part of it and move things forward and place my clients, you know, in certain material or, you know, set them up with different projects that, you know, ultimately will hopefully go the distance. Right. Mm. Um, you know, and so it's, 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 Oh, it, it, I had a client who was in a movie that did really well on Hulu last, uh, earlier this year during the, the, the COVID quarantine period. And it was great. It was so wonderful to see that success, you know, come through for her and, and help elevate her on, a, on another level now. Mm. That's interesting. I mean, that sounds, that sounds, uh, Again, a lot, you've given a lot of great, a lot of great gems, man. I really appreciate how um, precise your responses are and how practical the information is. Sometimes, you know, it's hard to elicit that, but I think because you operate obviously in the business mind a lot of the day, you, you just kind of hit, you hit the, you're hitting the beats, man. So let me ask you this, um, switching to more of like a practical kind of business custom question that I think becomes relevant, especially for junior agents or again, uh, young people who want to enter this world is kind of the expectations, these expectations of the clients, of the your business partners at the studios and networks, obviously of your colleagues. And one of the things that I'm just curious about, I think it'd be relevant would be this, what is the general expectation? You, did, you mentioned you do a lot of reading um, in terms of getting back to a client on their script or you know, or, or packaging something they're passionate about. Now, obviously when it comes to packaging, a lot of variables outside your control, but, um, but I just wonder like, is there a general time frame where it's like, you know, we've been at this for two months, no, there are no takers, let's revisit it next season or, or two weeks or, and then when it comes to material, you, you already probably have a ton to read every night, like kind of when, what is your general expectation um, for your clients is when you get back to them on material and maybe kind of quote unquote sell a land a deal? Uh, I think it's a case by case basis in it. It helps if you understand obviously what that client's expectations are for whatever it is. Right. Um, yeah. But most clients, if they send me something, uh, you know, again, the quarantine COVID time is a little bit different. Usually I can get to stuff a little bit sooner mm -hmm. uh, sometimes, but it, it, it just kind of ebbs and flows what the workload is right now. Okay. But generally speaking, I try to try to take about a week. Um, and sometimes if there's something they're really excited about and I can hear their passion, then I'll, I'll try to get back like immediately. Uh, wow. it, just, it just kind of de depends on w if it's time sensitive or not. Some will say, you know, I've been kind of like, working on this film idea for a little bit. Let me know what you think when you get a moment. Others will yeah. say, I think this is ready to go. I think this yeah, is ready yeah. to go. And I think there's a moment in the marketplace now to try to take this out. Um, mm. But that that's a big part of it is that once, once I read or process it a, a, after a certain point, it's wanting to offer feedback and think about, well, where can we set this up, right? Where mm. can we go? And, and who's maybe looking for something like this? Um, right. and, and so it's, it's also knowing, you know, there are certain stories that right now, right. I think light 
comedy and, and, and humor, but stories that are, are a little bit lighter in feel mm -hmm. um, will probably sell a little bit better right now um, mm -hmm. to certain, like say streaming platforms, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, I don't, I think, I, I, look, I look at the New York Times, you know, morning briefing every day, and it, it's 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 not pretty. So <laughs> yeah, no, me too. I, I think it, it weighs on on people quite a bit. So, you know, I think that is is something that people really want, or some you know version of escapism. I think is probably really important right now, right? Yeah, as as important maybe next spring. Perhaps not, and so then maybe it's a moment to kind of go back and, and think of something that's maybe a little bit darker, right? That mm -hmm. uh, might not have people just didn't have the appetite for. Because you got to also think, where are these all of these, you know, studio executives and and producers and such are, are doing the same thing we all are. We're, we're in our living rooms or in our offices at home, um, just trying to kind of get by from the day. And some people have kids running around or trying mm -hmm. to you know continue to teach them. Um, you know, other people are, are, are taking this quarantine, you know, really, really hard. And so it's just kind of being, trying to be mindful and strategize as to, yeah, the, you know, this is a little dark and maybe there's a shooting or something, you know, like that. And maybe right now is not the time we should keep this in the drawer versus, mm -hmm. oh no, this is, uh, this is, is, is really thoughtful and interesting retrospective on, you know, growing up in, in a Southern family and whatever. Right. And so mm -hmm. it's kind of weighing those out and then putting a strategy in place. And, and generally for myself on the talent side, you know, I try to bring in some of my counterparts who do more of those deals on a day to day basis to say, okay, uh, they've got this great idea or, or whatnot. Let's see how we, you know, you know, better, I would say to my colleague, you know better than I, perhaps, what is Netflix looking for versus what is an HBO Max or a Peacock or an Apple or an Amazon, right? And and they will help kind of put the strategy together and, and take a lead on certain things. Mm. Yes, it, that, that's great because it dovetails into the next question, which you've already kind of answered, which is like, you know, how the buying patterns and the appetites have changed since COVID. And we discussed a little bit of this offline, which is, you know, obviously, there's more of a demand or need for shows that are a little bit more self-contained and not these, you know, grand epics, right? Being produced in Iceland and Eastern Europe, right? For obvious reasons. So have you also noticed there being a shift? And I would imagine so, but in the financials as well, meaning like, you know, you can't get the premiums that you could have for your clients in the past because the industry is under such pressure economically or maybe because the competition hasn't changed and everyone's still vying for great material that you can still get, you know, whatever that price point was for that script or whatever that price point was for that format or whatever that price point was for that talent in lead role. So how is the, have the economics changed much? I don't think the economics have changed that much, right? Because at the end of the day, right now it's a, it's a lot of buying. Uh, there are not a lot of things that are shooting outside of Europe, Australia, New Zealand, and, and, and Canada is kind of ramping up their production right now, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it, I think it's a, a lot of just kind of easing back into it and going back to those pre-existing shows or ongoing series or films that were kind of in the middle of shooting and, and trying to wrap those up. Mm -hmm. Will they budget some of these productions in the future a little bit differently due to mm -hmm you know, assuming that we are living with the, the coronavirus at that point, mm -hmm. I certainly think so. And, and I think, you know, where does that come out of, right? Because mm -hmm. on some level, you know, you have to be able to make sure you're keeping everybody who's working on a production safe and feeling mm -hmm. safe. And, mm -hmm. but does that maybe come out of, you know, different aspects of the production budget or whatnot? you know, uh, eventually when we get to that point, but, you know, a, a great script, you know, should still, or a great package that you take to a studio or network should still sell, you know, should should be the same. Like that, that shouldn't mm -hmm. necessarily change things right mm -hmm. now. Um, you know, but I think we're, we're kind of starting to find out if it's a pre-existing show, let's say, and you are adding a role you know, they're going to have to go to the studios and make sure that they tr have the amount of money that they would traditionally have to try to find somebody 
um, at maybe a certain level, right? If they're not, if they're looking for somebody that is a little bit more established in the in the landscape, right? A little bit more of a star name or has some heat, you know, generally speaking, like that, you know, that, that generally would have a uh, need a bigger budget to fill that role. And so we'll, we'll kind of explore and find that as some of these more pre-existing shows kind of come back. But mm -hmm. I, I, I don't think things will change too much uh, on the economics as far as, you know, what somebody's value is out there. Well, that's good. That's good news to those, you know, of us uh, who are talent or who have literary projects, because, you know, I think a lot of people are afraid that, oh, my goodness, you know, I'm not going to be able to get the what it, what what I'm what I'm worth or what this project is worth, because I'm going to hear about, you know, the economic pressure these studios are under. But speaking of the players in the business and, you know, we talked a little bit about some of the main players, the Apple, the HBO Maxes, the the uh, Amazons and Netflixes, you know, these guys are dominating the, the, the business, but I'm wondering since the impact of COVID or maybe even prior to that, are there any quote unquote sleeping giants in the business that have yet to, you know, you know, um, ex exercise their potential domination and impact or is, ev is everyone pretty much, you know, we we're aware of all the major, major players and there, there won't be any surprises necessarily. Yeah, I don't think there will be any major surprises right now, right? I think, you are seeing all these different, you know, large media conglomerates launch their streaming services. And I think everybody wants to be in that, that business and try to figure out how to master that uh, mm -hmm. and be able to maximize a lot of these existing uh, libraries that they have, right? While also adding to it. You know, I think mm -hmm. you, you look at a, uh, a, a new streaming platform like HBO Max that has this wealth of a library from Warner Brothers that, you know, includes like a gun with a wind and such. And as well as most of like the DC universe and such. And there's a there's a lot to sell you on that. Um, and they're they're launching their new original series. So you can see a, a platform like that really doing well, uh, you know, over time and, and so far, right? And, and on the mm. flip side, you, you know, so I don't think any of these that have kind of jumped into the marketplace in the last mm. couple, you know, during the quarantine time would be considered a sleeping giant by any means because, you know, they have these large backings, right? And even mm. Quibi that has, you know, uh, kind of found themselves in, a, in a, a precarious position where they launched, but everybody was staying at home. So it wasn't the commuter kind of like streaming platform where, oh, I'm on the bus to school or I'm on the train to work and I can watch, you know, seven minutes of a, of a Quibi. I, I think, you know, th there was obviously some, some issues there and, and has not been um, has not hit on the same level that maybe they were initially intending to, but I think they're yeah. course correcting and trying to move forward in a way because they have some really good content out there. Oh, some incredible yeah. content. Yeah, I mean, and they're getting great people to be involved. So I think it's, if anything, it's a lot of people maybe doing some slight pivoting a little bit with within what are they spending their time, you know, working on. But it kind of goes back, and we talked a little offline about it, of, of Disney bypassing the theatrical experience for a film like Mulan mm -hmm. and wanting to capitalize on the moment now, you know, and I think, mm -hmm. um, and, and trying, trying something new. And, and on, on some level you have to, as much as I would have loved to have seen it in a theater, cause it just feels like it has that kind of a scope. Uh, you have to kind of commend them for taking this opportunity and, and wanting to kind of see what happens. Right. Mm. Uh, and, 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 I think, you know, you will have different successes with them. I don't expect they'll probably do that with their Marvel, any, you know, movies anytime soon, but they had already had plans of bringing Marvel to the platform in a real way in uh, limited series kind of capacities. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it'll be pe them all kind of experimenting a little bit more, but you know, at the same time, I think if you're going to go into production and we don't have a vaccination and you know, you don't really know what the trajectory of the virus is going to be come March of 2021, you'll probably take uh, 
you know, a look at more material that, again, is more COVID friendly, right? That mm. is a little bit uh, scaled down in production and not as many people on set, something a little bit more intimate between mm. you know, a couple people as opposed to a large, you know, cast or group at any one time, right? And so mm. I think you'll see, uh, and you have seen some experiments, you know, I, I, Apple had released um, um, a quarantine episode of, uh, uh, of the show Raven's Banquet, which I thought oh, was really good. That's the Rob McElhaney show over there that was okay. really fun to, to watch and engage with. So I think it'll just kind of be a, a case by case, you know, that people mm -hmm. try a few different things. But at the end of the day, you know, can you, you know, you can't have Stranger Things be done via quarantine, right? Yeah, it's not gonna work. At some okay. point, it, you, you've already set a number of what these shows look like. So, you know, they are gonna kind of have to experiment with this and see what works for people. Be creative. Okay, well, listen, we're rounding out the conversation. Thank you for that. That was very good as well. Uh, so we'll end with this question and from the perspective of, you know, maybe, you know, a junior agent at a talent agency someplace, maybe even a manager or uh, someone else in the in a producerial. But I'm wondering, with, are there any anecdotes, cautionary tales that you'd share either from the representation side, the buying, selling side that might shed some light on the complexities of Hollywood? You know, because we know, like you mentioned earlier, Hollywood in DC or Hollywood in politics are pretty much the same. You have a lot of you know, a lot of colorful people, a lot of, you know, interesting situations, let's put it that way. And it requires a certain level of maturity and insightfulness, emotional IQ to, to, to succeed when times get challenging. So I'm wondering, anything come to mind as a, as an anecdote or cautionary tale that can illuminate some of that for some of the younger people watching? Um, just trying to think, uh, what, what, look, I think, a, a, a large part of it is all, always understanding that everybody comes from different experiences. And I, I try to always think through or ask what are different people's like backgrounds and, and how did they, they get here, right? Mm -hmm. And I think one of the aspects is that we are sometimes all very don't take the time to slow down and actually get to know people in, in a little bit more of a of a legitimate way. It, mm -hmm. It's always like top line points, so to speak, or it's a little bit more in passing. And you don't all, you're not all necessarily in the trenches, right? Mm -hmm. I, as I mentioned earlier, in my responsibility and my coverage, I try to get really, you know, I get to know a lot of the different executives very well, but on a, on a, part of that is also that we've kind of been in the trenches together a little bit or we've kind of grown up into in, in the business um in most cases or we've tried to work on some deals together and we've like you know been kind of fighting for a common goal so you 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 have that and it helps kind of cut through a number of different things but i i would also say that i think it's just so so much of a relationship business and I think a lot of people prop maybe say that, or I, I, I've always truly believed that, you know, mm -hmm. and having been, you know, in this industry now for almost 10 years, uh, it, it is really, really, you know, helpful that if I know somebody who was at FX when, and was an assistant when I was, you know, uh, a, a young assistant too, mm -hmm. uh, to be able to kind of like call them and, and talk to them and, and speak to them. Um, and, and, I, and I think everybody just needs to kind of come into this though, knowing that they're always gonna have to work uh, and be relentless and, and work very, very hard and try to move things forward. Um, you know, and, and but we are, we are actively trying to kind of, you know, also change how people do come into this business and mm. um, what that looks like and how people are, are recruited and making sure that we have just different experiences that are throughout the inter entertainment industry. And I think that's, um, you know, I think the persistence and being relentless and coming in and working hard and staying hum humble and hungry are, are critical uh, to, you know, just making sure that you're not putting yourself uh, on, on the bad foot, so to speak, when uh, kind of trying to kind of make your way through here. And I think a lot of people need to maybe slow down a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. and, and not necessarily, 
uh, in a diluting of their personality or anything like that. I think that's what makes you special, but slowing down and, and, and recognizing that you, you have to, uh, so often this is about, you know, going through and waiting your turn. But I, I think it's really, really important to slow down and make sure you quote unquote, read the room again, mm -hmm. even as it relates to kind of coming up in the industry and just knowing who are the players involved and being you know respectful, but being thoughtful of how you want to kind of proceed. And I think oftentimes, sometimes people come into the industry thinking that X, Y, Z should be handed to them. And it's, it, and it doesn't, it, none of this really happens overnight and mm. on, on either side, whether you're the creative, yeah. whether you're the artist, um, or whether you're the producer or executive or whatnot, it is generally people who have put a lot of time and effort into kind of making their way through this and really trying to be thoughtful about what kind of a career they want on, on any side of it. That's great. No, no, well said, man. Well said. I mean, it's, you know, slow down a little bit, read the room, you know, um, just be a little bit more insightful in, in how you engage and respond. Uh, very, very, very important, very, very important uh, tactics if they're going to be successful, no matter what side of the business you're on. So, so Dean Fluke, I want to thank you again for taking time to join the Booking Boardroom. This has been an incredible conversation. I think it's going to be extremely illuminating for both young and old and people even outside the business. I think um, you, again, shared a lot of great insight and I appreciate the time. So of course, absolutely. yeah, yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Well, listen, guys, for those watching, if you want to see more content, be sure to subscribe to the Brooklyn Boardroom uh, YouTube page, or you can catch any of the clips and prom promotional material on any of the social media platforms at um, BKLYN Boardroom uh, on uh, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all that stuff. So uh, looking forward to uh, more conversations with you, you, Dean, in the future. So thanks again, and uh, wish you all the best out there in the COVID-19 season. Of course. Be <laughs> close well. some big close some big deals and get get in the trades, man, so we can celebrate. <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah, there it is. All right, we're signing off. This is